Hello everyone, I'm Tom. And since this coronavirus disruption started, I said disruption with a bleh, didn't I? I've been host, I've been hosting, I've been hosting this vlog to eat beef jerky and talk to you on the internet. I'm not a food critic, so the beef jerky part is silly and pointless. But this vlog has let me explore some fun ideas with you, especially regarding game design. And I plan to keep doing it. So here we are, the 18th of January, 2021. Wow. What a heck of a year 2021 has been already. And not necessarily good or bad, just crazy. Okay, not, not good. All right, so generally a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, a lot of anger, a lot of unhappiness. Oh, and let's not forget the coronavirus is still ravaging America. Um, I started this blog in early 20 vlog in early 2020, um, more like summer 2020, somewhere in there, um, so that I could you know, kind of have a contemporaneous record of the coronavirus lockdown and the coronavirus situation. Um, but I don't know that I've recorded it in great detail on this vlog. I've just generally said, oh, it's getting worse which has just generally been the only thing I've been saying about the coronavirus. Uh, however, you know, lately, as in this year, some people have been actually um, getting inoculated. I went and saw my general practitioner doctor for a yearly checkup a week ago, and the day before that, she had gotten her arm shot. That's awesome. Somebody's getting the vaccine, and I and my wife hope to get it sometime soon when we can get it uh, here in Ohio um, the state rules basically are giving it based on age so so I have actually gotten emails from the two major hospital systems in my Cleveland area uh, University Hospitals and Cleveland Clinic um, these emails are both basically saying hey we're going to give you a shot if you want it so sign up but U of H specifically detailed that they intend to do 80 year olds next week and 75 year olds the week after that and so on. Um, so me being almost 55, if you can believe it, I still have a month or so to wait at best before university hospitals are going to be able to give me an appointment and give me a vaccine. And of course, my my young hot wife is going to have to wait even longer. So, but there's light at the end of the tunnel, very obviously, and that's terribly exciting. But at the same time, everyone should still stay in and stay away from everybody and put your mask on because not only um, is the vaccine not here in significant numbers to make any real difference in, or, in terms of protecting you, but um, the coronavirus appears to be getting worse, especially in terms of... Uh, uh, it mutating into new strains that are even more transmissible than the old strains. Plus, there's a tremendous amount of evidence built now that shows pretty clearly that you can be hurt by the coronavirus even if you feel no symptoms whatsoever. Your, your lungs can still be severely scarred even if you've never felt any symptoms. Um... And if your lungs do get severely scarred, um, many doctors have pointed out that that severe scarring can be much worse than a chronic smoker in terms of lung damage. Um, and there are many other weird side effects and dis distressing long-term consequences that Theoretically, it could possibly affect you if you got sick with the coronavirus. Not the, men, not the least of which for men, of course, is erectile dysfunction. I don't want that. I don't know a man who does. So nobody should be taking this virus lightly. I know I'm not, and I know you're not. Uh, so why am I saying that? Singing to the choir. Uh, well, 
at any rate, this video is not really about the coronavirus, except it kind of is, except it kind of is, and it's supposed to be about jerky and video games. Let's talk about some video games. I have something interesting to talk about. Um, let's see here. So, isometric and isometric games and isometric art assets. This one image can be attacked in many different ways. So let's attack them. First off, let's talk about what isometric is. Technically, the term means the same distance. It means um, all the directions you can go are the same as the other directions. Uh, but that doesn't really mean anything except in terms of isometric projection, which is the term for basically how the little buildings and mountains and trees get drawn. That's the whole point of the isometric projection, which is often uh, shortened to isometric when we're talking about video games. The isometric art style, which you can see here on the left side of the screen, was one of the earliest ways for video game developers to approximate a 3D view of the world, a 3D view of the digital game world. It's not 3D at all, but it's clever. It's a clever way of drawing such that it can look 3D to the human eye. Um, and so, and of course it's 2D. All the, the, the image you see in, you know, the green image with the, the mountains and the trees and the buildings are all two-dimensional images uh, assembled and layered on top of one another. Um, and they're layered in a way that's a little bit clever, but not too complicated. So, you know, video game developers could do it, even from early days. Um, so isometric has been always a very popular way of drawing a game world since, since the early days. And honestly, nothing has changed because it's still, it's still a very popular way of drawing a game world. It's still a very popular way of... Uh, for play, it's, it's, it's an easy way for players to understand what they're seeing. Um, so, I'd also like to point out that this image is actually a screenshot off of a, a website that sells art assets for video games. A thing that didn't even exist 10 years ago, um, or you know, 15 years ago. And I have said many, many times to many, many people, that uh, there's never been a better time to make a video game than today. And part of the reason for that, but certainly not the only reason for that, is because it's easier to get art assets cheap or free than it has ever been before. Uh, now, as you can see from this website, I can pay 80 bucks, $79, for a license to use all of these images in a video game that I make, and I can sell that video game at least one video game according to the license only 80 bucks good grief that's cheap that's absurdly cheap and if i wanted to go lower in graphics or quality or you know not necessarily pick you know what i want i could probably find a similar set of art on the internet for free for free for use in my video game <coughs> so you know so if I wanted to make a game where you traverse a 3D world, an isometric 3D world, like the one you see in front of you, dirt cheap, terribly easy to use, um, you know, straightforward, well understood technology. And did I mention dirt cheap? And that's why we have, and have for several years, the so-called indie apocalypse, the idea that there's far too many video games and, you know, there's more than anyone could ever play. And so my games and every other indie game developers games get kind of lost in the noise uh, because this is one of the many many reasons why it's so much easier to make video games than it you than it used to be um, so i've talked about how cheap and amazingly easy it is to get a hold of this art i've talked about what the art is um, let me talk a little bit about the world obviously as you as you see it on the screen, um, this is a, kind of a world map. And usually when you see a world map like this in a video game, it's because you have an avatar that can traverse that world map. In other words, you have a little knight in the center of the screen and he marches or she marches around and 
can you know, go through the forest, go into the forest and fight monsters, go into the town and heal up and rest and buy new equipment, uh, cannot go through the mountains, and so on. Um, the original Ultima games um, were some of the first games to pioneer this vision of what the world looked like and how you were supposed to move through it and interact with it. Um, and again, it's very time-tested and very easy concept. However, um, there's you know a, you could also easily uh, uh, implement another game vision with this art set and this this image that you see in front of you, and that's uh, uh, a city building game. Now, a city building game is a subset of what I call a s system game. Um, I call it that because I haven't liked anyone else's uh, terms. I haven't liked anyone else's dictionary words for what we're talking about here. Uh, because, of course, I'm a very deconstructionist, you know, mechanical thinker in these things. But there are a lot of city builder games. And the thing they all have in common is, is that um, you are kind of the, the god emperor slash uh, mayor of a town or a city or whatever and your main decision is what building goes where um, so you make sure that you plant the town center first and oh no everybody needs some food so let's start with a hunter's lodge put that down because it's a town center uh, we need to move, build a lot more buildings so let's build a, uh, a logger camp to uh, go out and log down the trees and chop down the trees and then of course you know the trees get denuded and then that makes you more space where you can set up farms and buildings and things so and so on but the key here is is that there's all these relationships between the buildings you know the the city doesn't work without a city center it, to get uh, wood you need to build a logging camp to get uh, finished wood, you need a lumber mill, and to store wood, you need a lumber yard, and so on. You know, all these relationships between the buildings and the different, you know, assets of the game, but mostly, you know, from building to building. What building does what in relation to what building is kind of the data heart of a city builder game. Um, and because of that, with a city builder, you quickly get into the the meat of why I call it a systems game. And that is is that, as, as my experience with a systems game, the fun is not found in placing the buildings. The fun is found is in tweaking the placement of the buildings. In other words, you build a system, you build a sustaining system. Okay, making sure that you're, um, you've got your town center and your lumber camp and your farm and your textile and your you know whatever have you and your sheep she your shepherd and you know you get all these pieces so that you can keep all of your little townspeople alive but then you look at it what you've built and you optimize it you say well the shepherds really need to be closer into town so they don't get those the sheep don't get continually eaten by wolves um, in the logging camp is not far is is not close enough to the uh, trees, so there's an inefficiency there. The little guys have to walk back and forth a long way, so let's move that, and so on. So you can see that basically uh, any systems game, and it doesn't have to be a city builder, but city builders are a perfect example of it. Um, dungeon builders, and there are several other types of games out there that are also systems games. Um, the, the point is that I believe that the fun was always found not in setting up all the buildings and saying, oh, now I've got all 10 buildings. No, it's about making sure that this building is right in the proper place to be maximally efficient, to say, ah, I need to make sure that this lumber mill is exactly where it needs to be. Oh no, that means that the, the farm needs to be moved. Okay, where does the farm get moved to exactly? That's where the fun is. That's where you lose track of time. That's where you... When you're playing SimCity or any other city kind of building game, you you look up at the clock and you realize it's 3 a.m. It's because you've been fiddling with the system. You've been optimizing. That's where the true fun is. And you can see in this image that you can see where that would be. Look at, you know, we've got town centers. We've got some uh, 
various buildings. We've got some roads. We've got a little river there. Um, you know, what do they do? And what do they, uh, uh, what do they mean to each other? What are the relationships between the buildings? Well, usually in a game like this, you'd hover your mouse over it and get a little pop-up that would tell you that. Um, and then, of course, you, that would help you build the understanding of how you're, what you're building and, you know, allow you, again, to choose whether your, your buildings are just in the right place or need to be moved one square to the left or one square to the right. So, um, yeah, that's what I have to say about this image and about isometric uh, tiles. Um, all of these are deep rabbit holes, but, you know, this is what I've been thinking about today. And it's a fun thing to think about. All right, but enough about video games and blah, blah, blah. Let's talk about the, the, the marquee reason we're all here, and that's beef jerky. In this case, Baja Jerky Salsa Fresca. Um, we've had Baja Jerky before. The, we had the, the, slump, the, the lime and uh, something. It was spicy and it was limey, and, it, and both of those things took a while to kick in. I would have to say the Baja Jerky so far has pleased me and obviously been a very tasty and bold kind of brand. But we've only tried that one, so it's time to try, us, try their Salsa Fresca. Let's open the bag, see what we get. It's like Christmas every time! Okay, maybe not, but, you know, it's, you know, tasty every time. Here's a nice piece of jerky. Let's give it a try. Mm. Mm hmm. Baja jerky salsa fresca. Man, I wish I actually had a, uh, an advertising deal with these companies. I certainly know how to, you know, face a product and sell it to people. Okay. Salsa Fresca suggested to me that it would be a lot bolder than it's been so far. It's sweet and light. I sometimes talk about a molassesy taste, a very heavy, dark molasses taste in some jerkies. This has zero of that. There's no heavy taste to this jerky at all. It's good texture. It's not too dry, not too wet. Not at all spicy. There's no kick whatsoever. So it's, well, hmm. I would say that it's been a long time since I've had beef jerky that tried to taste like popcorn. Tried to taste that kind of, trying to be light and fluffy and un inoffensive and maybe a little sweet. Um, but this salsa fresky Baja jerky certainly fills that bill. All right. Let's open the mail bag, shall we? The mail bag is, as is often the case, um, filled with only one letter from our good friend Adam Para. Um, and Adam, in this case, from the last video, uh, says, thanks for the video. Thank you, Adam. Talking about unintended uses for games, what is one of the best ways Artemis players have surprised you? Um, Thanks for the question, Adam, and also you have another couple of questions, but uh, first off about the Artemis things. I'll tell you exactly how they surprised me, and that's with their real-world bridges that they've been building. So, when I first made Artemis 10 years ago, I said to myself, there's got to be nerds like me who have a Star Trek bridge already built in their basement or their garage and they're just waiting for my software. And I'd even seen kind of reviews and, you know, things in magazines over the years that suggested that that was the case, that there were people who'd done that. Um, and I'd seen, you know, things where, where people had made, you know, kind of mm, entertainment rooms and things like that that had a Star Trek theme. And I fully expected those people to contact me, and they never, ever did. Instead, people contacted me and said, now that I have your software, I'm going to build a, a spaceship bridge in my basement or my garage. Um, I got a lot of those messages. And 
boy, did they follow through. I know for a fact that they followed through because, number one, I have, uh, you know, an active and, and an excellent forum uh, on, you know, associated with my Artemis website, and people post about their bridge building all the time. And number two, so far we have had four um, Artemis conventions, four yearly Artemis conventions, we call them Armada, and these conventions are filled with those bridges. These conventions are an opportunity eagerly taken for these people to take all of their cool, amazing bridges out of their basement or their garage and put it on a truck and drive it for miles and bring it to a hotel ballroom to share it with everybody else. And they have done so. So I know firsthand because I've seen them, I've looked at them and I've touched them of all the hard work and beautiful br bridges that people have built. Again, I didn't dare to imagine that this would happen. This is a, was a complete surprise to me. I just thought that somebody would have already made such a thing, and but they didn't really have software. If I was their software guy, but they'd already made the, No. They said, now that you have the software for us, now we can go ahead and build the bridge, and they did. And they're still doing it. And there's a lot of evidence on the forums that everybody being locked down for 2020 only meant that they were going to work harder on their home bridges. So, um, yeah, what's most surprising to me about the players of Artemis is how much work and effort and energy they put into those amazing custom home-built bridges. I love each and every one of them. I think they're amazing. And I really want to do more Artemis Armada conventions because I really want people to come and show off their bridges. I love, they're just so amazing. I, you know, I can talk about them and look at them and play on them all day long. And that's kind of the point of that convention. It's that basically that's all everybody does in that convention. All right, and Adam also asked a question. Also, what do you mean by store-bought? I have never made homemade jerky. Well, that's actually kind of two things, Adam. First off, by store-bought, I actually mean going to the corner store and buying beef jerky. Usually, when you go to the corner store and you buy beef jerky, you've only got Jack Links and a, maybe another brand or two brands. And that's the most you know popular, most dis well-distributed. But as we all know from the, watching this channel, there's a lot of of craft jerky out there. There's a lot of indie brands of jerky. Uh, and it's usually the case that you can only get them in a specialty store or online. That's what I mean by store-bought. The, the stuff you can go to the 7-Eleven or the Circle K or, or another convenience store and get. That's kind of what I meant by store-bought. Um, so this Baja jerky, I've never actually seen it in the, in the corner convenience store so I would not necessarily call it store bought if they you know they really ramped it up and you know took off like wildfire and it was in every corner store in the country I would say of course now suddenly Baja jerky is store bought but again this is my own terminology um, and he also asked about homemade jerky and of course tons of people eat, make and eat homemade jerky I have I have stopped and bought homemade jerky on the roadside before. Um, I have uh, I have made some jerky. Um, I tried to make jerky in my uh, in my hot air fryer, um, which is not really the optimal way to make jerky. Uh, above other things, Alton Brown did a whole video or a couple of episodes of his Good Eat show about making beef jerky, and of course, in his opinion, it's about carefully seasoning the crud out of the meat with salt and, and vinegar to destroy any buggies. And then the key for him is not to cook it at all, but simply dry it over time. And he has some elegant, you know, home kind of do-it-yourself solutions for that. And he pointed out, I think, because I watched this video years ago, he pointed out how a lot of, you know, kind of single-use beef jerky meat, meat drying tools and devices that are out there um, cook meat more than they dry meat and uh, and his thing was about making sure that it's dried and not cooked you know I've had it both ways it's tasty either way um, 
But I know for a fact that even if all you have is an oven or a box fan, you too can make beef jerky. Uh, it's just, you know, it's one of those things. Um, but also there's a lot of good beef jerky out there. So if you don't want to make your own, you don't have to. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's worth trying a time or two is I guess is what I'm saying. Um, so yeah, thanks for replying, Adam. And if you are not Adam, but you would like to reply, I certainly encourage you to do that by, uh, posting a comment down below here on the U YouTubes, or I also post this to Facebook where you can uh, also make a comment if you would like to. Um, if you want to get notified, then you can hit the subscribe button and the little bell so that you get a message every single time one of these videos goes up. Um, I appreciate making them, and I appreciate you watching them, and uh, I appreciate you and I getting together and, and getting through this, this plague time together. Uh, Baja Jerky Salsa Fresca. Some of the lightest jerky I've ever tasted in terms of taste. There's nothing heavy about it. It's very light and very uh, mild and, you know, kind of sweet, but not, not, I would not say that it was overly sweet. I would say that it was overly light. It's one of the kind of airiest kind of, mm, kind of not heavy uh, jerkies I've ever tasted. Not bad. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.